Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series has been on Christian education. This is actually the last lesson in that series, lesson number 13, entitled Heaven, Education, and Eternal Learning. Not just eternal living, eternal learning. It's the lesson for December 26, one day after Christmas of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, once again we thank you for coming to this earth and making that incredible sacrifice of living all those years in obscurity and then that incredible ministry and then finally your sacrifice there on the hill of Calvary. We will never ever be able to understand fully and completely everything that happened there from that marvelous birth all the way through to the end. But now, Lord, we look forward to the day when we'll be able to rejoin you in heaven and have that marvelous learning experience from then on for the rest of eternity. We look forward to it. May it begin soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What happens to a person, male or female, after they die? Who has the ability to tell us the truth about what happens then? Only God has accurate and correct information about the afterlife. Tim? A poet, fearful of death, asked how a person could live without, quotes, knowing for sure what dawn, what death, what doom, awaited consciousness beyond the, t the tomb. He created in his poem what he called the IPH, the Institute of Preparation for the Hereafter. Yet, how can one prepare for the hereafter if one doesn't even know what happens to a person in it? Bible Study Guide, December 19. So often our lives are so consumed with the urgent, what's got to be done right now, that we do not have time to think about the important. I'm sure nobody else has that problem except me, right? <laughs> the schools of today have such a challenge because of the amount of knowledge that is available is beyond the grasp of any one human. We try to cram as much po as possible into our education and we forget, and we forget, uh, are we forgetting what is the most important of all? Blaise Pascal, a French writer and philosopher, was thinking about the state of humanity. After deliberating with himself for some time, he said there's one point which is very clear. Gary? No matter how long a human being lived, and in brackets it says, and back then they didn't live all that long, and no matter how good that person's life was, and in brackets, and life wasn't all that great back then either, sooner or later that person was going to die. Moreover, whatever came after death was going to be longer, infinitely longer than the short span of life here that preceded death. Thus, for Pascal, the most logical thing a person could or should find out is what fate awaits the dead, and he was astonished to see people get all worked up over things such as, quote, loss of office or for some imaginary insult to his honor, quote. <laughs> Yet they paid no heed to the question of what happened after they were to die. And that's from the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide for December 20. Yeah, imagine, oh dear, dear, someone's, you know, despised me or something like this. Well, what's going to happen to you after you die, huh? <laughs> yeah. So where can we look for an accurate description of what happens after we die? Only the Bible with its inspired records can make that clear. John 3.16, the most favorite text for many Christians around the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Of course, this is from King, King James, James, so I'm sorry. I no, it's <laughs> fine. Not reading. First John 3, uh, 5, 13, that second, First John 5, 13. I'm writing this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life 
you that believe in the Son of God. So now we've had two verses that told us about eternal life. Go ahead. May I put a, another one also? Yeah. John 17, 3 says, yeah. For this is life eternal, that yes. they might know the, the only true God whom thou hast sent. First yeah. Timothy uh, 1, 16, But God was merciful to me in order that Christ Jesus might show his full patience in dealing with me. This is St. Paul speaking. Yeah. The worst of sinners, as an example, for all those who would later believe in him and receive eternal life. And receive eternal life. Diana. John 4, 14. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring which will provide him with life life-giving water and give him eternal life. Wow. John 6, 40. For what my Father wants is that all who see the Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them to life on that last day. Wow. Jude 1, 24. 21. 21. And keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ in his mercy to give you eternal life. Titus 3, verse 7. So that by his grace we might be put right with God and come into possession of the eternal life we offer for. Excuse me, we hope for. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just a tiny sampling of all the verses in the New, of many verses in the New Testament. See, the goal for, for Christians is, is eternal life. God plans that for you. All you have to do is join his side in the great controversy. And I would like to repeat this. I wasn't the first one who said it, but I've repeated it many times. There was no reason for Christ to come the first time if he's not planning to come back. Think about that. There's no reason for Christ to have come the first time if he's not planning to come back. That is why there are so many clear promises in the New Testament about what is coming beyond death. God does not intend to allow the evil we live with today to continue indefinitely. But Christians, and especially Seventh-day Adventist Christians, have a real challenge in trying to convince an apathetic world that they need to give thought to the future life. So, what can we expect in that future life? Revelation 21.4, He, that is God, will wipe away all tears from their eyes. In other words, there will be no reason for sorrow or sadness ever again. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. So we cannot extrapolate from all the bad things which are happening in this world today to understand what is going to happen throughout eternity. Have you ever tried to talk to a non-Christian friend and explain to him your beliefs about eternal life? Sometimes such people respond by saying, why would you want to have any more time in a world like this? Some but, it's just the opposite. Yeah. I'm, you know, why, there's nothing after this, so I'm going to have my best time here. I'm going to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are some like that. I have something to add here. Mm -hmm. um, um, all the all the reformers believed that when someone passed away, they did not pass on. Mm -hmm. Now they all believe the moment someone closes his eyes, you have eternal life, either in hell or in heaven. All the Christians, except the Seventh Adventists how things have changed so quickly. Yep. yep. The new expression is, he or she passed. Mm -hmm. yeah. You didn't pass on, you didn't pass off, you just passed. <laughs> yeah, right. And much of that comes, I think, from the concept that one of the major churches thinks that you go through a veil. Mm -hmm. You go to the other side through that veil and you passed mm -hmm. through it. Well, but the new heavens and the new earth we are planning to occupy will be completely different from where, we, uh, from where and how we are living now. Jim? 2 Peter 3, 10-13 
But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens it will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it with, will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your life should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Let's make it to come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. But we wait for the God, for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth where righteousness will be at home. Where righteousness will be at home. Boy, wouldn't that be something. Yeah. Carrie? I'm reading from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride dressed to meet her husband. Can I interrupt for just a second? I've had the privilege of actually visiting the Isle of Patmos. It's a little tiny sort of dumbbell-shaped island, and they tell you, okay, here's the spot up here, there's a sort of cave on the side of the mountain, here's where the, where, where, uh, the Apostle John received his vision. I don't know whether that's true or not, but virtually anywhere on that island, you can just look out and there's a sea. And John could look out there on a clear day and almost see Ephesus, where he'd come mm -hmm. from. And you know, I, I wonder what he thought when God says, there will be no more sea. And he said, I'm on my way, <laughs> I'm on my way to Ephesus right now. Yeah. Anyone lives in Patmos? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, quite, it's a very interesting journey because... Um, you travel, the, the, the whole shoreline is Turkey. Right. But the island belongs to Greece. Mm. So you travel across there and you hand over your passports. They keep them mm. while you go and visit Greece and then you have to get back. You want your passport back, you have to get back on the boat and go back to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah it's, and of course in Turkey there's nothing about Christianity. Right. And you go, you get to the island of Patmos, and everything is Christianity, the churches, and the, all the kind of stuff there. How far is it from Greek mainland? From the Greek mainland? Oh, it's a long ways oh, from the Greek yes, mainland. Yes. It's only a few miles off the coast of Turkey. It's, I would guess, maybe 150 miles from the Greek mainland. Oh. It's all the way across the Aegean. I'm surprised they haven't had war over that. Of course, they didn't have... Well, they did. Yeah, they well, I mean... And, of course, what the bottom line there is there's a whole chain of islands there that are all that all belong to Greece, even though they're right off the coast of, of Turkey. And the reason, of course, is that the people who live there are all Greek because they, the, they were the seafaring people. Continuing from with verse 3, I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. Then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. And he said, It is done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To anyone who is thirsty, I will give the right to drink from the spring of water of life without paying for it. It's from the Good News Bible. Yeah, even though John was elderly, he probably had to work hard. Yeah. Every day, except, except Sabbath. He refused to work on Sabbath. Um, and just think of him receiving these messages about what the what heaven is going to be like when uh, after that having that kind of experience every day during the week but very quickly though uh, it says now god's home is with human beings mm -hmm. well he always wanted it that way yeah always mm -hmm. yeah the, god isn't the one who changed things right 
Shouldn't the most important question in our lives be about how we can be a part of that new world? If we really understood it, would we allow anything stand in the way of our being there? Charles? Yes. Heaven is a school. It's filled of study, the universe. It's teacher, <laughs> the infinite one. Yes. A branch of this school was established in Eden. And the plan of redemption accomplished, education will again be taken up in the garden school, Eden school. The Eden school, yeah. Beautiful. That's education, page 301. So imagine that, okay? The whole universe, you want to study those planets that are beyond the way out there somewhere? Okay, fine, just go and have a look. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about getting there, you can get there instantly. You want to study some sub-microscopic thing, you want to look inside the atom? Okay, let me show you how you can do that. Mm. Eyes have not seen, ears yeah. have not heard. Think of the awful things which are a daily part of our world today. Sin and suffering, sickness and death. All sorts of tragedies from hurricanes to fires to floods and earthquakes. Why is it necessary for us to go through all this sorrow, pain and suffering, even losing family members and friends, to prepare us for living in a world where there will be no death, no crying, and no trouble? Okay, all you brilliant theoreticians, you theologians, answer that question. <laughs> Why do we have to go through the time of trouble before we can go to heaven? Well... Kind of sorts out the sheep from the goats, doesn't it? Okay, well, that's, that's a possible explanation. Yeah. When someone who takes this world seriously and looks at all the mysteries, from the microscope to the astronomical, the, they, that need to be studied still further, can we even grasp all, that is to, all there is to learn? The Bible has a few words to say about that. 1 Corinthians 13.12 what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. And 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. So you should not pass judgment on anyone before the right time comes. Final judgment must wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light the dark secrets and expose the hidden purposes of people's minds. And then all will receive from God the praise they deserve. So now let's do a little flight of fancy here. Imagine living in a, in a world where God is present and every question will have an accurate and good answer. Think of all the theories that have, people have had down through the years turned out to be wrong. When I began medical school about 50 years ago, the very first day in our class, the dean of the School of Medicine came down to say a few words to the freshman class, and he said, I, I have something unfortunate to say to you. He said, we're pretty sure that about 50% of what we're going to teach you is wrong. The problem is we just don't know which 50%. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And how it has changed in 50 years. Yeah. Well, heaven will not be like that. God is not just going to tell us the answers to every question. I mean, that's, that teaches, Diana, you've never, you never set up and just say, okay, got any questions? Here's the answer. Got any questions? Here's the answer. That's not the way you teach. So what's heaven going to be like? Well, God is going to say, figure it out for yourself. And if you need some help, we have lots of help available. He's going to challenge us. That will be an eternal journey of discovery. Are there any serious questions that you have which weigh on your heart and mind? I mean, pick your subject. You know, if it's a scientific thing, dig into it in depth. If it's a philosophical thing, Let's talk about it. Sit down. Let's, we'll talk about what matters. Anything you want to talk about. Are there things that seem completely incomprehensible? Well, we have an answer for those. Hmm. When you think about how God has helped us with the things that we do understand, doesn't that give us faith to trust Him in what we 
do not yet understand. It should. So what do we know about the, that future school in heaven? It's interesting that, and I, maybe I should have put it in here in our study, one place Ellen White says, Jesus will lead those who didn't have a chance to understand the plan of salvation along the river of life and explain to them things that they never had a chance to learn before. There's going to be a big beginner's class. Surely there are going to be people who are going to ask, what are those marks on your hands? Yep. And perhaps we will be there too because we want to hear it again. And there's something important about that question because there are many people who believe that when we are transported from this life into the next life, everything about sin will be, will be erased and forgotten. So when the little girl comes up and looks at his hands, and says, what happened to your hands? Jesus is going to say, well, I wish I knew, but I can't remember. <laughs> I mean, that would be so sad. But uh, aren't we told he will always have the human form? Yes. We will he'll, have those, he'll have those scars, he'll yes. have the sodas. And even, I just recently read some even scars on scars his forehead from, forehead from the thorns. Therefore, that's why it safely said, Affliction shall not, not rise the second, second time. time. Perhaps that's going to keep that balance. And who else than Christ himself? Well, we know that there are a lot of things that are real, but which are unseen even in this world. As a brief example, we cannot see God or Satan or angels. But in that future world, all of those will be visible. And if you think about it, about what's going to happen at the third coming, everybody who's ever been alive will be there. Not only that, we will all have that veil off our eyes so that everyone, the wicked, the righteous, everyone will see what God is doing. They'll see God, see what God is doing. They will see Satan and what Satan is doing as that panorama is played out. In 3D. In 3D. With Jesus rising up high above the city of Jerusalem where he will be crowned king of the universe. And everybody will see him. And it will be so compelling that even Satan himself, when it's all done, said, he'll be down on his knees and say, this is Philippians 2, uh, verses 10 and 11. Every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. Well, in that future world, all of those will be visible. The prophet John saw some of it, and this is what he said. Revelation 21. Who's got that? Is that me? I think it's you, yeah. I then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride, dressed to meet her husband. If you have ears then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to eat the fruit of the tree of life that grows in the garden of God. And then finally, Revelation seven fourteen to 17. I don't know, sir. You do, I answered. He said to me, these are the people who have come safely through the terrible persecution. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. That is why they stand before God's throne and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will protect them with his presence. Never again will they hunger or thirst. Neither sun nor any scorching heat will burn them, because the Lamb who is in the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Goodness Bible. But... Let's be honest here, okay? We only have the barest minimum of hints, even glimpses, of what is going to come. However, we know that all the evils that beset us in the world will be gone. There, when the veil that darkens our vision shall be removed and our eyes shall behold that world of beauty of which we now catch glimpses through the microscope. When we look on the glories of the heavens, now scanned afar through the telescope, when the blight of sin removed, the whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. 
What a field will be open to our study. There the student of science may read the records of creation and discern no reminders of the law of evil. He may listen to the music of nature's voices and detect no note of wailing or undertone of sorrow. In all created things he may trace one handwriting. In the vast universe, behold, God's name writ large, and not in earth or sea or the sky one sign of ill remaining. That's from Ellen G. White's Education, page 303, paragraph 4. You talk about nature's voices. I had two very interesting experiences. I go running almost every morning. Go out running about 5 o'clock in the morning in the dark. This time of year it's in the dark. And for the first time, I think in 30 years, I saw a live raccoon. Wow. Read something. This live raccoon walked across the road. There was a big high chain link fence. He just scampered up the chain link fence like there was nothing, no problem. Just choo, 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 sat on the top of a, a cement pillar that, that the this chain link fence was attached to and just sat there and looked at me. And then I, I, I went a little bit further down and there was a bird and I'm almost sure that it was some kind of an owl. But he made a hooting sound. I don't think we have hoot owls. I, I don't know what kind, but it yeah, was making yeah. the... Just beside we our house, I, I watch it every evening. Oh, really? Like, oh, yeah. This one is making uh, a really strange sound I've never heard before. Hoot! Right. Hoot! Yeah. Hoot! Yeah. There was, sitting, on, sitting on the there. telephone wire. Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Right, right. Wow. Um, you know, the thing about our... We, we read this, we talk about heaven, but everything is put in humanness. Yeah. We, we in know terms. so little, yes. and yet we try to talk about it in such grandiose terms, yep. and we don't even get to the first paragraph. Yeah. So it's not. It's going to be yeah. what we think about now is just going to be nothing <laughs> compared to the yeah. dynamicness. Just, just to, just to give you an example of what we're just one thing. When we stand up as tall as we are, as we can stand up, we won't even reach to Adam's belt. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just, just, to, just remember the scale we're talking yeah, about it, here. It, but but the the way we describe it, yeah. we think we're using the most elaborate terms. We think we're yeah. talking about the most beautiful things, and we're not even close. We're not even on square one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just try to imagine in, in in your wildest imaginations the beautiful, most gorgeous imaginations of your thoughts with with heaven guiding you. What it will be like. When I see a, a sunrise, I mean a yeah. sunset at night, yeah. my husband and I kind of laugh and we say, you know, God's paintbrush and his art <laughs> studio is so gorgeous. Yeah. I just want to get in there yeah, exactly. and, and see his paints, not yeah. just mine. I want his yeah. because there's nothing that we can do that can replicate a sunrise or a sunset. Even if you take a picture, it never is good as it. No, we, no, we don't even begin to do it. Yeah, it's we like, can't even copy it. It's like that tonight when I came down. Yeah. This big yeah. orb just there, just yeah. barely above, and you knew it was going down. It didn't take a long to go down, but it was just that deep orange, fiery color. It was just mm. marvelous. Yeah. Uh, we, we never should be ever so busy to appreciate yeah. little things, and these are not little things, no. you know, yeah. uh, of life. So we're going to challenge you. Think about what might have happened to you this last week. Think about your um, things that you've imagined. What would you like to, to, to explore most of all? Heaven will be your chance. Mm -hmm. Explore whatever you like. One of the most exciting things about that new earth is the one who will be the teacher. Jesus was always teaching. He took advantage of every opportunity that presented itself. Matthew 5, 2, And he began to teach them. That's Jesus' teaching. Mark 4, 2, He used parables to teach them many things, saying to them, this is good news, 
uh, Luke 19:47. Every day Jesus taught in the temple, and the chief priests and teachers of the law and the leaders of the people wanted to kill him. Let's get rid of this guy. We cannot handle him. I, you know, it's, it's amazing you think about it, how that actually worked. I mean, the temple was their territory. They believed they were in charge. They believed that they were supposed to control whatever was said there. And yet, what would happen? They would show up early in the morning, all of a sudden, Jesus was already there, and there was a huge crowd wanting to listen to him. Well, what can you do? There's, you couldn't rush in there and arrest Jesus. The whole crowd were hanging on his every word. The, 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 the sheer hatred they yeah. had yeah. of him. And he was a Mr. No, nobody. He was a bum. Yeah. In their eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. John six fifty nine. Jesus said this as he taught in the synagogue in Capernaum. That was uh, Peter's oh. mother-in-law's place. Right. Yeah. Synagogue there. Notice once again what Jesus' main theme for teaching was. Diana? The, jo the law of Jehovah was burdened with needles, needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one, represented as belonging to the character of God. And that's so true today, too, yeah, in so oh many, God. so many places. Yeah. Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose of his own mission on earth, to set men right <clears throat> through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou givest me to do. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God was to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. You can and find that in the Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Yeah. And those couple of paragraphs there, it's like six times, six times Ellen White says that Christ's main work was to come and correctly represent the Father. Think about that. What does that teach us about what we're going to need to learn in heaven? What will we have a chance to study? I mean, the Father's going to be right there. And Jesus is going to, I, I'm sure he's going to teach us, well, let me tell you about the Father. And then the Father's going to say, let me tell you about Jesus. Well, Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. And Isaiah 9, he said, be known as Almighty God, mm -hmm. Everlasting Father. Yeah. So it'll be Jesus. Yeah. And it, it doesn't fit a lot of people's preconceived notions, but uh, the texts are there to support that position. Yeah. This is a song that we sing, End of Faith as its Beginning. Mm -hmm. Set our hearts at liberty. Yeah, we don't need any for faith. He's here, right here. We are in his presence. Yep. If you scan over any portion of any of the Gospels, you will find that Jesus was continuously teaching. Are we ready to enroll in that university where there will be no graduation? And he said, no remember, fees, hmm. no classrooms. <laughs> we go back to that text again. Also remember, that was in Garden of Gethsemane. It was before he had his trial and before he went out to die he says I've accomplished the work you gave me to do to do I've made known your character yeah yeah exactly <clears throat> the only reason he came the whole purpose of his mission yeah to reveal the character and well, you, in support of it also you can go back remember in Jeremiah 8 verse 8 the scribes say oh we've got the law but Jeremiah 8 goes on and it says 
the scribes have made it into a lie. And of course, Jesus said in Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seven times, one right after the other, starting at verse, 20, verse 13. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there was a lot of misrepresentation. And that's why we today have to dig through that. Unfortunately, we have our, our uh, interlinears uh, available to us, and we don't have to listen to the words of a misguided theologian. Yeah. Well, one friend and scholar has suggested that each Sabbath, you know, Revelation, I'm sorry, not Revelation, Isaiah 66 says, each new moon and each Sabbath, we're going to do what? Come to Him. We're going to come together and worship God. Okay? okay. And this person suggested, well, when they come together to worship God, we'll, we'll be so excited about we learned, what we learned the previous week. We'll say, do you know what I did? I went this, and this is what happened. This is what I found out, and so forth. And I'm sure God could say, smiling, or the angels will say, smiling. That's exciting. Why don't you try doing this next time? Next week, try this one. See what you find. I mean, every week will be some exciting new adventure. Wow. Those wonderful heavenly beings would turn to us and say, okay, why don't you try investigating this new subject next week? And that will lead us into another wonderful world of discovery. But one of the things that will occupy much of our time is thinking about all that God has accomplished through the plan of salvation. Zechariah 13, 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm. Wow. Mm. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. So the angels are going to learn something about what? The life of Jesus, right? It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. They see What's, what Satan did to Christ all through that. And they realize what kind of a scoundrel, scoundrel he is. And then they see what God did. They see both sides. And this is, this is their education. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden. The plan of salvation, notice this sentence very carefully, the plan of salvation making manifest the justice and love of God provides an eternal safeguard. How long is it going to last? Eternal. Eternal. Against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889. It's very interesting to read these, some of these very important incredible statements here and they're not copied in any of the books that are later produced just in the original articles Shit. what do you think Ellen White was talking about in the next section this next section the years of eternity as they roll will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ as knowledge is progressive so will love reverence and happiness increase the more men learn of God the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of, the, of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransomed thrill with more fervent devotion, and with more rapturous joy they sweep the harps of gold, and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> I remember, I've remembered on a few occasions where combined choirs have come together and there have been as many as 200 people singing. Mm -hmm. Okay? Imagine 100 million angels. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know. It would shake the earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how many parts, different parts would they sing? <laughs> I mean, we, we think once in a while we get more than four parts, not very often. Sometimes, usually there's one part, there's two parts, there's three parts, there's four parts, and then we sort of run out of capacity. 
I'm sure that in heaven there's going to be mo maybe 16 parts to every song. Mm. Handel's Messiah, you get pretty close here and there, and then the soloists. But uh, you never forget those things. Yeah. Okay, Jim. The great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all, all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Great Controversy, page 678. Those are the last couple of paragraphs, the last three paragraphs of the book Great Controversy. Well, take a few minutes and read that final incredible chapter in the Great Controversy entitled The Controversy Ended. I, I, I would like to give that as a challenge, for, especially for you Sabbath school teachers. That last chapter is just almost beyond belief. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> How much of this is uh, that you put in versus this being in the Sabbath School quarterly? You're not supposed to ask that question. Um, <laughs> That's a trade um, secret. Cannot, just cannot help it. Yeah. Quite a bit that you have put in, or quite a bit. No, look, um, um, and perhaps the Sabbath School quarterly itself has some. Oh yes. Yeah. Great, because uh, you know. Uh, having grown up in Adventist and uh, going to divine worships, you don't hear uh, Ellen White's uh, writings anymore, and why not? Yes. And I'm glad Clifford Goldstein, if he's listening ever, you know, uh, thank you. Um, he's the editor-in-chief of the Sabbath School Quarterly for years yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that uh, we are still finding these so relevant in our lives. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Gary. Take a few minutes and read that final incredible chapter in the great controversy entitled The Controversy Ended. Here's a, just a few snapshots from that. <clears throat> the lion we should much dread and fear here will then lie down with the lamb and everything in the new earth will be peace and harmony. The trees of the new earth will be straight and lofty without deformity. Let all that is beautiful in our earthly home remind us of the crystal river and green fields, the waving trees and the living fountains, the shining city and the white-robed singers of our heavenly home, that world of beauty which no artist can picture and no mortal tongue describe. Let your imagination picture the home of the saved and remember that it will be more glorious than your brightest imagination can portray. Wow. And that's from Ellen White, Heaven, page 133, paragraph 1 through page 134. Okay. A few years. A uh, fear. No, a fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Now let me interrupt for a second. What's the usual idea about what heaven is? What, if you ask a, well you look at a cartoon of heaven, what, what is it? It's some guy floating on a cloud and playing a harp, yeah, right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh brother. <laughs> well, I, I'm reminded of a little bit the sound of music. Uh, the hills are alive with the sound of music. I mean, this is going to be yeah. 10 million, million yes, times exactly. better than that. We have. Yes, uh, those who. Uh, what are. What, yeah, that you correct. Those, uh, who, those who accept the teachings of God's Word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly, heaven, heavenly abode. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Ellen White, Great Controversy, 674. So anybody who still has a wondering mind would like to discover things, to think about things, they should want to go to heaven most of all. I mean, where, 
talking about a place where you have a lot of things to explore and discover and so forth, nothing on this earth even comes close. And if there's, if you get stumped, you can't figure out how something works or why, guess who's there to explain it to you? Yeah. Well. Again, that's because we we put human constraints on things. Yeah. We, we don't have the ability to think beyond us, but we put our own constraints on things. Think of the Galileo story. Uh. Yeah. So crazy. <laughs> yeah. I had a, once I had an opportunity when I, back in when I was in college days, going there to that leaning, famous leaning tower. You know, Galileo went out there and he dropped something off, because here you are leaning out over this. I dropped a little coin worth about a tenth of a cent over the, and just down into the grass, and I raced down the stairs and <laughs> ran out. There, and believe it or not, I found it. I found it out there, that, this little coin that I had dropped. I took it, I, I don't know whether I still have it somewhere or not. But Well, some might worry that eventually heaven will become boring because we will have discovered everything there is to know. Even in this world, the fields of biology, geology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, etc., have so many things to learn every time we discover something new, it opens up new fields to learn uh, new fields to learn. Scientists now know that there is no simple life forms, for example. Even the simplest cell is incredibly complex. I've had the privilege recently of and I've mentioned this in this class, uh, of listening to some lectures by James Tour just as you would know, the tours and a travel. Um, and he just points out just, you know, we are so far off from even understanding how to construct a single cell. We're not even close. Anyway, um, even the simplest cell is incredibly complex, so there will be no lack of information or opportunities for study in the school of the hereafter. But how can so many people in this world live as if there were there is no hereafter? Is it because they do not believe there is any way to know what, know what really is going to happen? Jesus warned us in Mark 8, 36, do people gain anything if they win the whole world but lose their life? Of course not. Jesus spent much of his time on the earth trying to get people to realize all the mistakes about God they were believing and to turn their minds to the truth about him. Learning about God will be an eternal study. There will be no disappointments, no boredom, no apathy. The common view that we are going to be floating around on clouds playing some kind of ethereal harps is completely erroneous. The glories that await these those redeemed from the earth cannot be exaggerated. First, there is the absence of pain in all its forms. No crying, no sorrow, no death. And that's referenced in Revelation 21.4. There will be no future source of sorrow because he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I make all things new, in Revelation 21.5. Sin is the root of suffering, and every part of it is kept out of the precedent of the redeemed, Revelation 21.8. Second, all our past sufferings are consoled since God himself will have wiped away tears from our eyes, Revelation 21.4. We will be kings and priests in, unto God, Revelation 1.6, with the undeserved and staggering privilege of sitting with him on his throne, Revelation 3.21. One can only imagine the heights of worship and praise that will flow uncontrollably from hearts overflowing with gratitude for what God and the Lamb have done for us. Can you see, can you see joining the yes, 24 God. elders and casting our crowns before his feet? Revelation 4.10. How can words adequately describe such a scene? Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Well. But our greatest study throughout the eternity will be God himself and all that he has done and all that he will do for us. Abraham Heschel, and I, I talked about the panorama so many times, described there in, in, in Great Controversy, page 666 and following, and 
we're told that even 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 the wicked will get to see it from the from the fall in heaven all the way through to the end and as it really happened just like you were actually there 3d living color and i'm sure that god will you know if we have a question about something he said have a look i an example i've given in the past was many years ago here in california there was that 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 great trial that is on every television station all day long you know <laughs> is he going to be guilty considered guilty or not guilty you know and the does the glove fit does the cap fit and all those kind of things and you know, that's not the way god does things if you had a question like that to god said, oh sit down there let me show you Poof. and there he would you would see the whole sequence exactly as it happened and you draw your own conclusions just amazes me when i think about that well we know how god creates yes i well let me just make a suggestion um it has been suggested not my idea but i think it's a great idea and i think it's probably true that when after god completely cleanses this world this ball of mud and, and water with the fires of the of, of, of that destroy all sin and sinners I think he's probably going to turn to the geologist. He said, come up here in front. Would you like to see how I did it the first time? <laughs> day one, day two, day three. There's no reason to rush. I think he's probably going to let us see exactly how it happened the first time. But when he gets to day five, I mean, to day six, there's no reason to do another Adam and Eve. We're already there. So we'll see. Um, Abraham Heschel shares never once in my life did I ask God for success or wisdom or power or fame I asked for wonder and he gave it to me hmm. wow that's our Bible study guide page 172 is it possible that we were hardwired for the purpose of learning about God Jim C.S. Lewis mused God made us invented invented yeah, invented us as a man invents an engine. A car is made to run on petrol, and it would be would not run properly on anything else. You could tell that he's British. Yes, petrol. Yeah. <laughs> petrol. <laughs> How God designed the human machine to run him on himself. He himself is the fuel. Our spirits were designed to burn. Yeah, it seems strange to talk about burning, but. God is our source of, of energy. He's a source of life, and He always will be for the rest of eternity. Can you remember a time when you were excited about learning? Children sometimes show that intense excitement. They might even say, wow, what is that? How is it happening? Why is it like that? What can we do with that? I remember we had a neighbor one time, young girl, and she, just with that age, and she would just stand there. She would... Why? 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 She would never stop. <laughs> the mystery of God will be our eternal study. In the Bible, mystery is not something impossible to learn, but rather something that only those who have been educated about it understand. Consider this. Gary? Another text that is often used to highlight the unimaginable glories of heaven is, quote, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, unquote, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. This text has thrilled many with the anticipation of how amazing heaven will be. However, the specific context of this verse does not support the idea one, that no one has seen what is being talked about, and two, that heaven is primarily what is referred to as that which God has prepared. First, the very next phrase after the text in question is, but God hath revealed unto us by his Spirit. So that which hadn't been seen or heard has now been revealed to Paul and company through the Spirit. Is this speaking of Paul's receiving a preview of heaven? Not likely. The verses before our text are speaking of the wisdom of God, hidden in a mystery. 
This mystery is tied to the opening thought of the chapter, which speaks of Jesus Christ and him crucified. A quick phrase search for wisdom of God and mystery in Paul's epistles makes it apparent what Paul is speaking about when he says, I have not seen nor ear heard. He is speaking of the gospel of the crucified Christ and its magnificent results. Wow, just think about that. Hmm. And then they lay out Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, Ephesians 3, 3 to 6, uh, Colossians, 1, uh, Colossians, 1. Colossians 1, 26, 27, Colossians 4, 3, Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. The more contextualized understanding of this famous text doesn't take away from the glories of heaven. It adds to the glory of knowing God and his purposes as seen in Jesus Christ and sees we can experience these glories now through the Spirit. This is our heaven on earth experience. And that's from the teacher's Sabbath school. Okay, friends, stretched out before us in eternity, we have either all of these opportunities that we have talked about or the other choice is eternal non-existence. And we have a choice. Will we choose God's loving side and live the good life? Or will we choose to be selfish like Satan was and cease to exist? Every morning as we arrive, as we arise, I'm sorry, would it be appropriate for us to choose God's side? Might we, might we say, today I choose to walk with God. Or I choose to be a disciple of Christ and learn all I can from Him. Today. Might you choose to say, to see and treat others the way Jesus did? Would you even dare to choose the satisfying joy of holiness over the fleeing pleasures of sin? Surely we would choose eternal life over eternal death. Are we prepared to let Jesus make a new creation out of us? Are we prepared to begin that education that will continue forever? Mm. Okay? I'm challenging each one of you to enroll in a university course. You can start with the grade, for grade one if you want, but that, a course that will go on forever, never stop. And as soon as you think you understood one field, God will say, well, have a look over here. Learn a different subject. Take, look over here. Do this subject. Back and forth. There will be no time when we won't be something to learn. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to be a part of your family. Yes, Lord. To have these blessed promises available to us. May we Take advantage of everything that it teaches us and all, and think about the marvelous joys that are still to come each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.